Yeah, welcome everyone to cloud computing and big data. Today is short lecture 15. And this is about the big topic, big data streaming. And there are lots of tools in the open source domain. There are lots of tools in the AWS web services. So we will look at those tools a little bit and of course at some of the motivating applications, but it's of course such a big area that it needs, let's say, many different course hours to really go through this. Um, there are many different flavors and aspects of it. And you can see that with streaming real time data, uh, this has tremendous importance today, um, not only for, let's say, time critical applications in business, but also when you think about real time measurement devices that are in the scientific and engineering domain. So before we go into the material of short lecture 15, let us just review what we had the last time. So the last time we had a little bit talked about online social networking and graph databases. And these are incredibly related because we have seen that this online social networking platforms where we have many famous examples like Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, um, all of those have big data that's very clear to us given all the users, all the content they upload with videos, with pictures, with comments and texts. But we have also seen that this growth essentially is quite different than you would assume from typical SQL databases, from let's say more structured information. We see a very un homogeneous growth in different directions, depending of course on different properties. One could be that there's a very, let's say, interesting profile of people where lots of people like those profile, which is perhaps a natural growth as we would speak. And another one is of course, then you spend advertising money of let's say promoting your page in Facebook or on Twitter which is a not natural growth, but of course a growth which goes in a certain direction because you spend money on it. And this was a very important topic for us last time because we always wondered why Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, all of those are actually cost free services. You can just enroll, you can use them without paying anything. But we reviewed a little bit that of course the added value of registering there is by providing data, content, high quality content even, and in a real time fashion, all the time, 24 hours worldwide. And this is of course a tremendous data source and to really cope with the data, we were looking then in a data structure that can really be you know, used to have all of these different entities and relationship really viewed it in real time fashion. So this needs high performance data structures. And we have seen that the graph representation of such an online social networking is quite straightforward. We have always, let's say locations, we have check-ins that we do there, or we have people, users uh, from different, you know, uh, parts of the globe. And all of those together form a big mesh that we kind of see here very nicely. And this mesh is representing essentially this unhomogeneous growth of this big data that we have there. And as the graph representation, you can now apply graph theory aspects, which means in computer science, you have a very good performance of traversing graphs, of getting information, of getting the subsequent or the previous data. Um, there are interesting properties that we cannot reveal as part of the short lecture last time, because essentially graph theory and graph databases is a complete university course on its own. However, take away the message that, of course, all the big players, including Facebook, have seen the benefits of graph databases. We have reviewed the last time this Tau graph database that Facebook is using. But also important is to say that they using all maybe graph databases, but also other databases that we had before. So this were no SQL databases like HBase that run maybe in a MapReduce ecosystem and they use it all together. So here that should mean that basically graph databases are now the only tool used because they are so powerful. They have their unique selling propositions in particular different areas. And of course the ones here with social networking where you have relationships, entities dynamically formed, um, that is quite an interesting endeavor. Now the trick that we have seen also in the Tau graph database in a way 
um, derived from the graph theory or from the graph representation of the data structure is that you have always the inverse as well stored. So you would say you don't only like a topic in Facebook, you also can say it is liked by. And when you do this consistently throughout your data set, you are really able to much better traverse the graph to really have a real time experience that we want from Facebook. Because as we were saying the last time in the lecture, when we would have a Facebook and we see a like, which actually happens, uh, for instance, half an hour ago, this would be quite a lame service or we search something, a profile on Facebook and Facebook returns, well, please come back in 20 minutes Then we have all the profile data and all the posts of that person. So if we would have this, let's say poor performance, nobody would use this service. And in, in turn, you can imagine that, of course, the performance of these services is key to the design of Facebook, is key to the design of Twitter and all others. Now the interesting other perspective we took last time to think about what big data now gives us is the revenue streams. We have been digging a little bit into this ad business, which is fueled by cloud computing all over the place these days. We see it already when you use a Google search, usually you have the first three entries would be a Google ad and that's what you can buy from Google, these places. And of course, it's a revenue stream of Google, but we have also seen that this is true for Facebook. They have the same approach with Facebook ads and of course, Twitter ads, and you can name it. Now, the interesting thing is that we saw we can connect these worlds, right? So the interesting thing in clouds today, uh, while we will see, for instance, Facebook as a SaaS cloud service, um, you can connect this to a typical website as we have seen here in this big data tips website where you essentially can make an ad on Facebook to really grow in popularity in your profile on Facebook, but have a direct link to your, let's say, big data tips web page where you have then the different um, interesting ads again put in where you earn revenue. So on the one hand, you pay in Facebook to get your profile known but by getting your profile known, of course, people visit more of your website and in turn will then click more on the ads that you put on your own website. So it can be a business model. It is a boss business model today, but also something which has to be taken with care. Firstly, Google AdSense, which allows you essentially to put your own commercial ads here on your own content website is of course reviewing what you're doing. So you cannot put, let's say 200 advertising and then three sentences with content. That's what they will not accept. And then at some point in time, we'll even lock down your Google AdSense account. You have just one Google AdSense account. You cannot have one in different countries in order to be you know, uh, also in line with tax regulations in different countries. You would have uh, a possibility, of course, however, if you do high profile content and you do it with quite some velocity, you do it, let's say daily three, four posts and have a very popular website, which means you not only raise in the Google search, you also of course have more clicks, have more visitors through that and then turn of course more revenues because every now and then people will click on those ads and by each click or by each illustration, you get a few couple of cents up to maybe sometimes even a euro or so. So this could work out and is of course one of the strategies of the influencers that you have now heard in the media, which is an interesting job title, title also handled with care. It looks nice living in hotels for free to then post something about the hotel and then get lots of revenues, but it's also an instable business. Think about that Google anytime can close your account because you maybe did something wrong. You have another one where you basically link it to gambling, online gambling and Google perhaps don't like it. Uh, or any other adult schemes I don't want to go more into detail in. But of course, you have to be thankful to, to, to that this business model can break quickly. However, people have shown that this works. And one idea could be, of course, if you consider it as a hobby, right, to do something about your hobby, you like to write about your hobby, you do photos, whatever it is, high quality content. If you want to at least finance your website or earn a little bit money on the side, chances are that with Google Ads and Google AdSense in particularly, you can actually uh, make some decent money on it. Make sure, of course, it is in line with the tax regulations.
We also have seen the same approach in YouTube when you do now very many videos in YouTube, uh, people doing this and reached extreme popularity uh, up from small children that do this with their parents and then get very popular on YouTube up to businesses. However, also there, um, the key message is you have to have some certain threshold to be even eligible to get monetization essentially from your videos. And also this is of course a business model which could be anytime stopping when if YouTube again decides that your video content is not in line with the policies and policies keep changing. And in this sense, just be warned of, you know, starting now suddenly and basically off and want to be an influencer and stopping your computer science degree here. That's maybe not a very smart thing to do. However, combining this might be something that is of interest and looking more deep into this. Now, much of this is related to data streaming high quality content. And this brings us to the short lecture 15, big data streaming tools and applications. The last one of the real topics we have here in the course. It is an extremely big topic and that's why we just presented here as a short lecture indicating that we just give links, just outline a couple of tools and applications because in a way you need a complete university course covering it. So in this sense, we, we just really thinking about data streaming in, in terms of a couple of open source tools and then looking in our cloud um, that we already know from the AWS, for instance, or looking at tools we already know like Apache Spark and the streaming library. So all of this gives you lots of pointers for much more lectures um, and, and tutorials which are out there where you can basically look then on, on things how a Amazon Kinesis, for instance, as a streaming tool in the AWS field, we already know, is really used. It's tremendous. It has four different flavors how it is used. So this alone would fill a couple of university lectures if you go it in detail. And also if you think about how we can connect this again to the broad service portfolios of the AWS web services. Then of course, think about that um, data streams interactive access, visual analytics is not really very disconnected. It is in one way or another overlapping. When you have data streams, you want to look at them. You want to have some interactive access to understand it, to filter it potentially, even if it's manually or automated. And then visual analytics have been coming in this place as well to really think about what are data streams to make it visual. And we will have some examples of it. So in understanding this, we also connect to different lectures we had in the past. And one was, of course, Apache Spark, the different library supports from SQL, machine learning, or as we have seen the last time with graphs. Also Apache Spark, of course, supports the streaming library, which you could use, for instance, with the Microsoft Azure Cloud, as we have done already with logistic regression. Would be very similar steps, just apply, of course, then the streaming library. And we have a more detailed look, of course, in the AWS Kinesis service, which is a very strong service and have many different application areas alongside it, which reach uh, really from an intruder detection system based on cameras up to trucks on the field for crops, where you have maybe sensors and want to analyze it. So all different types of data streams. And that's why kind of the idea of this lecture is really this point us into different directions. Um, of course, by having reviewed all this commercial data streaming tools, the next necessary step for us here in the lecture is really thinking about what is open source providing to us. And you will see there's a huge amount of services which are able to really work in the domain of streaming, reaching from Apache Kafka, Apache Flink, Apache Storm, Apache Flume, up to new approaches with Nifi, uh, Apache, Esamza and others I maybe not even could list here in part of the lecture because we kind of time restricted here as well. So there's a huge open source community and every one of these open source tools will have a little bit of a unique selling proposition. And as you know, a little bit from the past already from the lectures in memory approaches are of course quite beneficial. They are very fast. There's almost nothing faster than memory except maybe cache. But of course, you also have to think about it. You have to pay the price for it. Running basically an in-memory approach on a machine, let's say on Amazon or so, um, where there's no memory available, then it doesn't make sense to deploy the service. And if you want to have memory available, you have seen that sometimes costs. 
So here you see that, of course, there's different tools. Let's say, for instance, Apache Storm versus Apache Flink is exactly this, this point when, when you sometimes maybe have still a data stream, but it's not mission critical. You don't need to have, let's say it's super fast. You still want to analyze a stream, then you maybe use just Apache Storm instead of Apache Flink, which might be much faster, but for this, you know, being faster in memory, also you have to pay the price of having resources which offer you large memory. We will look a little bit into Apache Kafka, which is kind of a broker, really data streaming platform, a larger topic again, we could spend a whole university lecture on. Interestingly enough, used in business all over the place. It is broadly adopted, a very massive service in, in data streaming. And to look into, let's say then again, a couple of different directions with data streams, we also look on the online machine learning approach. This is a little bit different from machine learning you have learned essentially in the beginning of this course where we had logistic regression classification or where we had deep learning networks looking at big data and then you know provide a classification of an image as an example. So here we're talking about learning on the fly, online learning, constant stream of data and I learn on the fly. It's a different type of machine learning really. Of course, some of the algorithms are similar and you could say that some of the learning theory is of course then also similar, but think about that you have a changing way of data and a changing way of how your model looks like when you have a constant stream of data. So we look into this a little bit and ending essentially this lecture also by providing some examples here from the scientific data streams that could come out of let's say a simple device like the Earth uh, plate observatory, right, which has a constant stream of data observing our earth plates in terms of earthquakes, uh, alluding to the fact that we had in one occasion here even an earthquake uh, when basically so we had a presentation here. So you see these tools are also incredibly important, different than in the business sector, that's for sure, and there's a video about it. So fasten your seatbelt for the last lecture really in this course with real content. The <clears throat> next lecture will be much more about thinking job opportunities in the epilogue and reviewing a little bit the course content as a whole. So let's understand the data streaming tools by let's go step by step firstly of understanding data streams in itself. We could see there are different data sources these days. Um, one might be web action. So everything you do in social media, right? Um, you think not when you consider maybe one channel that's much, but think about a company that has to observe all of these channels at once. So someone is making, you know, bad statements about your products in Facebook, suddenly it's on YouTube. Some have picked it up and shared it to Twitter. So immediately you have a stream of actions against your company, which you try to somehow uh, you know, engage in either it's with comments justifying, let's say this bad statements or just reviewing the policy and maybe just get rid of this post, which is possible if it's, let's say sometimes really um, a bad language and things like that. So you see, this is definitely a data stream, which is often hidden in log files. Um, there could be different elements to it, social media, and you want to analyze it in a dashboard. You want to look at it. You have another type of streams, you would say measurement devices, right? They have something like we have seen and have basically talked about at the beginning of the lecture, if you remember one petabyte every 10 seconds. So the velocity problem here. So this is a measurement device, the square kilometer array that will come and deliver us with unprecedented data, but we have to digest this data, right? The point is not just storing it, we have to work on it, we have to look at it. And this is where these optional filters also come in. These filters cannot be just, let's say, bad language in the uh, social media world. This could be also in the filters that there is noise in the data, there's malfunction. So we filter data usually out in the streams or we particularly search for things and then look only on the data that we filtered, like event analysis, right? Or outlier analysis in order to drop it. And to say, this is an outlier, it should be maybe put out of the stream, it's not relevant. So it really depends on what you find in the stream of thinking that filters might be useful for the positive or negative thing, so to speak, for really looking on data or removing that data maybe. And then, 
these days you can imagine with having large high performance computing resources or even maybe high throughput computing that we observe in large cloud installations, the simulations that we've seen, for instance, in the Uber cloud with CFD computation fluid dynamics, uh, visual, having turbulence data, or you see as an example, astrophysics with a black hole. Um, and, and these kind of simulations have very tremendous big data are also kind of a data stream we have to look into. Maybe we want to steer it. We want to really work on the data and look what is now the properties of this black hole. Uh, we will filter maybe on the stars which are directly in the data stream uh, close to the black hole to really understand what the interactions. So these are all different types of basically data sources and all different types of data things where we want to do something with. So, and this can of course, depending very much on your application. Another type of data stream that we see today is really this crowdsourcing from movies even that are today crowdfunded. You could apply the same idea of, you know, judging for instance data sets or you annotate data which is out there, let's say images. And there's a certain idea of citizen scientists that, you know, basically are there, not really having maybe a degree, but they love what they do. They go around um, and essentially make a photo every now and then from a couple of flowers. So this is huge data. There are lots of citizen scientists which are not really uh, maybe having a very high trust, but given their orders of magnitudes of people, uh, they really contribute to exabytes of big data. And then there might be individuals which really have this as a key hobby. They go every weekend and a very strict rule into the nature and make from the same flower, the same photos to really see it growing. So these are data streams where you would say, well, a hobby guy would be already having a moderate trust in data, but still, of course, it's not maybe the domain experts, but he can still contribute significantly to science or to other findings by already having a consistent approach of you know contributing to big data creating maybe not exabytes because they're not so many that have it the same hobby essentially so here we're talking maybe about petabytes and then if you think about that scientific people engineers the domain experts they maybe have a very high trust in the data they know exactly what they're doing but they're also very rare you need a scientific degree, you need maybe a doctorate for it. So for that, you have less people to work on the data or to create and generate data. And that's why today we have also lots of activities to really engage the citizen scientists, to engage the hobby scientists, if you will, in, in things like crowdsourcing of data to really help, let's say the scientific and engineering community to really have more data streams available from certain sensors, particularly in the light of the fact, if you think about that all the, the mobile phones we carry around right now with having exceptionally well photographic images taken could really help enormously in science and engineering today as well. So these were examples of data streams, um, which are kind of popular. Let's have some challenges. So quality is of course a key concern as you heard, right? Different people have different types of quality. This is one part of it. Another one might be a measurement device that is measuring, um, let's say 24 seven a day and suddenly something happens with this measurement device. Uh, in the middle of the night, no one really notice it because after some, let's say, rebooting of the device automatically, it will be having the measurements again in a very consistent form. So in other words, um, there's a certain part of the time series which is error prone or not exactly, uh, you know, what you want to have. It could be even missing values that these values would be not measured because of course we reboot it but nature is carrying on. It doesn't wait for the measurement wise to, to just wait. So essentially these are all challenges where you now look at that humans with a very long time series, very much data taken would be overwhelmed by looking at each of these time series manually, especially as we see today more and more sensor devices and essentially much more data sets coming out with high velocity of data streams and with this looking, let's say, in a manual way for outlier detection, for missing values uh, or correlating data, validating data is a really tough challenge in this data streams. Hence, we need tools which enable us by using maybe data mining methods, techniques, visualizations, visual analytics to really maybe 
indicate or detect those error prone measurements much more easier and in an automated fashion and to work on it. And this brings us to, of course, another interesting challenge, which is something related to, you have already heard in lecture 10, when we talked about the EOS B2 share service, let's assume we would have a data measurement device and essentially you would have no measured data, but you want to then cite this data somewhere. You want to have this certain persistent identifier, if you remember, based on the handle system. So you always wanted to point to this data set and it should remain unchanged. But if you do so and you want to talk about this and many people move into this direction, that's why we have EOS, let's say as a B2Share service for an example with a PID functionality. What happens if you have a time series data which essentially never really ends? right? It's kind of an update of an unfinished data set. Uh, or essentially, if you think about the missing values we discussed that maybe are somewhere hidden still in the machine, but was not really um, spilled out into the measurement. Uh, how do we update those data? So of course, this is in conflict with the idea of persistent identifiers. But you also don't want to have the data set now that you update in this very long, let's say data set from Marine Micro, um, microanalysis or as we said here in astrophysics we see the square kilometer array then you don't want to have a PID for every little update on this. So you see in a way it's, these are two reflections of in what trouble you can come to if you also think about cloud setups, large setups uh, which we actually still have as open questions here every now and then how to deal with it. Another part of it which is now I think more and more really throughout the market is this interactive access, right? You want to have data streams not anymore just uh, coming in some logs and you know, then you notice it, make some nice visualization. You want to have interactive visualizations. You maybe want to even change parameters on the fly. A video timeline click is one example and then see all the different data to it. Or you have essentially then this data stream where say maybe we have to change the angle on the resolution, you know, of our scientific measurement device and still look at the stream what happens. So this kind of interactive access of really modifying the real time um, of essentially these devices or social media or even simulation on the supercomputer is a very hot topic because it, it really enables you to get real time insights and then on top better understand also essentially your um, cause and effect, right? When you do something with a device and what effect it has in the data taking. So these are all topics related to data streams and immediately can see now that each of those topics is so rich that we service. Um, beside the core, we said there are different libraries for SQL, machine learning, but also graphs as basically we have explored the last time. But there's also significant streaming support that you see here. For instance, if you want to count basically just the word uh, in a, let's say, Twitter stream, for instance, here an example that it would consider Spark, but it could be basically your product or your service, whatever is what you do. You have a very nice way of quickly see how uh, essentially this um, is, you know, executed. And not only is it quick, it's also very user friendly. So you would have in a couple of lines already a very powerful tool. We learned all this already when we looked a little bit on Spark and using it. And on top of it, we gain everything which is about this reliability. So now think about what you see here. We have a data stream, but suddenly a node crash. So what happens with this data stream um, you see here? Of course, Spark then again, if you remember with your resiliency has an opportunity to really then restart and then get this really fixed in an automated fashion. And it also works essentially with the streaming tools. So this is a very nice library. And as you know already, I think mean, now at the end of the course, you can imagine what would be all subsequent courses you would say, well, you go again to MS Azure, you have the HD Insight where Apache Spark can be easily deployed. You learned that. So when you learned that, 
what prevents us of just using that or this library? Nothing. So you essentially say, instead of using the machine learning library for logistic regression or the graph X with graph databases, I use now the Spark streaming library in the same way. Of course, think about, you have to deploy the number of workers that actually have to do the job, but in the sense, it's very much similar that you already learned today and can start today, essentially by using MS Asia with the Spark streaming. Of course, for us, it would be also interesting to see what other tools are out there. And one of the very interesting ones is, um, because it's very similar to MS Asia, is of course Elastic MapReduce, we already have discussed several times. And you can imagine, like I just say before, with MS Asia, the same can be done with the Elastic MapReduce service, which is Hadoop, Spark, and all the open source projects in the AWS Web Services deployed. And so this is one way of how you could work with streaming in the Amazon field. But I also want to highlight the streaming data service they have. Amazon has a very powerful Kinesis service. We want to have a more look in, which actually is used for real-time analytics in a lot of companies, including Netflix today. And of course, something very interesting because it comes in different flavors. And we will look what all these different flavors bring as a unique selling proposition of using this Amazon Web Service. Of course, again, this is quite complex. Um, data streaming is complex and includes lots of data preparation, ingestion, storing data up to the analysis and the output. So you see here some examples um, which are given in a more or less high level fashion here to really understand Kinesis different types of analysis, but each of those needs much more elaborate time to really go into it. But Amazon has also very nice tutorials on each of these different service flavors and a very good way of really understanding these services. You can also see it's used by big players in industry. Netflix, again, uses here the Amazon Kinesis to monitor and communicate all the communication between all applications. And you can see it's, of course, a very lively service and essentially also um, to really ensure that the core business model, the service uptime and the Netflix availability to customers is preserved. And for this, they have lots of data that comes from social media streams into this Amazon where they want to analyze the social media and they can use something called the data streams from the Kinesis service to really ingest and store the social media data and then perform some specific analytics on it. So you see here services which are already fine-tuned for specific purposes, data ingestions, especially for social media, for real-time processing, then having hashtag data generated in real time that you then can use with other Amazon services here for post-processing in the data streams, and then essentially can make, for instance, trend analysis. How is this particular movie in Netflix working out? A new series, for example, is it high frequent in social media or are the people bashing it? So these are things where you can use, for instance, the, the Amazon Kinesis different types of services together. You see here, there's four different flavors, video streams, data streams, data firehose, and data analytics, and we will move through them a little bit faster. They're quickly understood, I think. Most importantly, this one, because here you could connect uh, any type of an input camera device, video device, which then is perfect for Kinesis video streams to ingest then this kind of videos and put them into, let's say, the Amazon landscape. And there you have different options. You could do, you know, simple recognition, um, which means even intrusion detection, what you can do. We learned about SageMaker for machine learning. Uh, MXNet TensorFlow, you can apply your own deep learning if you want on this video streams or basically do more on video processing. So here you have already a fine-tuned service really for video streams and is of course used incredibly often outside. One example application I brought you is law enforcement where people of course, um, they do essentially capture the stream and live feeds from the plates here, the car plates and put this into an Amazon Kinesis video stream to be analyzed then 
very easily, you know, for machine learning, identifying a car plate is quickly and nicely easy because it's essentially just digit recognition. And essentially then you can have this very nicely supported in Amazon with the AI services and then really can essentially track. Of course, this is a, a sensitive topic. Uh, you can imagine it's again uh, against or violating essentially personal data. But of course here law enforcement by searching specific cars, for instance, that have been stolen or whatever uh, speeding. This is of course something where these technologies are used with speeding cameras and so forth. So uh, in a way, a very practical example and more generally maybe are these kinesis data streams. When you think about you have all sorts of different inputs the first thing you always want, if you want to do something on Amazon, to handle these streams and then ingest this data. And uh, you maybe want to do the elastic map reduce that I just was alluding to directly with, you know, using then maybe the Spark library that we just heard, or you want to compute it on EC2 with your own, let's say proprietary functions or uh, applications. You can also stick a data stream into data analytics services in order to do an output. And here's a very interesting example because it brings you back to a kind of physical world where tractors today have sensors, right, in the agriculture domain. And they have lots of data streams coming from the sensors where you can have predictive maintenance. You can see when we should replace certain parts in the tractors. Should we already order them, right? Replacement parts can be quickly ordered automatically to be on time there so that the agriculture business can just carry on and getting the crops, for instance, from the field. So you see really practical example like this one, where we talk about the data fire hose. And this is an interesting thing because <clears throat> it enables people that have to do otherwise very much manual data stream injection, like with the data stream service to automate a lot of the process. So here essentially you store just the data uh, on specific elements and it does lots of automation uh, along the way, which would mean a lot uh, to really analyze it. That's why I brought an example here when you think about the Hearst Corporation, <clears throat> which runs 15 daily and 36 weekly newspapers and 300 popular magazines. And they all want to have the clickstream data pipeline really analyzed online. And for this, they're using essentially this Kinesis data firehose to really automate a lot of processes, which otherwise, you know, would be done manually by the menu, would be done manually by the Hearst team. Um, for instance, working then with Amazon EC2, analyze it and so forth. So another interesting one, and you can even do it in a batch style. So overnight, for instance, and then transform and crypt data stream, which are sensitive, a very powerful service to automate a lot the process of bringing lots of different inputs together <clears throat> and storing them properly. Then the data analytics goes with its name. I think it's pretty clear. It has lots of functionality to query and analyze all the streaming data that you bring in. It can be, of course, connected to the Kinesis data firehorse you see there when you, for instance, have lots of websites, lots of input data you put into analytics. And then you also also want to analyze this you know, outcomes of all of this analytics in a more straightforward way and use again firehorse to really have this process data then really stored automatically. So, and, and with this, you really have lots of different options of to combine these services and it will not actually add to too much insights. But um, you also see that essentially, um, these are all commercial services. Now questions arise, what can we do in the open source tool domain? And this is a very rich question. It has many different tools. I just could quickly, through them where you have the Apache Flume example, for instance here, which sees everything like a channel and you have a source and a sink. And basically you could see as an example here, again, uh, either tweets or YouTube or social media at large or a web server. And you have a framework which is based on this source channel and sync and then lands in the MapReduce ecosystem. See HDFS you already know and have learned from lecture five. So the idea, however, is that we do something with this channel, that we actually have so-called flume events, right? So we basically want to pick out this one that you see here in red and do something with it. And we, there's a specific functionality inside this flume that enables us to look in these channels and then filter. They are called interceptors. 
And with these interceptors, you can do different things. One idea would be that you, for instance, some of the Twitter tweets engage in maybe cancel them if there's bad uh, language or something, or if you want to, let's say, have a data measure measurement service and you want to delete data as a whole. Of course, it depends directly on your use case. Another open source tool is Apache Storm, and it's quite broadly used today. You see Yahoo, Spotify, um, they all use it in one way. It's a little bit more a, a distributed real-time computation system than just streaming. So it has quite some reliability, in, similar like Apache Spark inherently. It is supposed to be very, very quick, very fast, but we will see that Apache Flink is even more faster, but of course requires memory. And Apache Storm also is quite fast of working on millions of tuples really per second per node to analyze streaming data. But also this would require a complete tutorial. So let us just compare a little bit those tools. Another tool, as I was alluding to, is of course uh, Apache Flink. It really benefits a lot in this MapReduce domain and also in the normal cloud domain with EC2 and so on, using in memory wherever possible. And of course this is good, but it also has this cost factor that I was already talking about. So you need memory systems that really have computing, but also high number of memory available, which usually costs. And the second thing is also what I want to put here as a side comment in this. You see now many different frameworks, Apache Mahout for machine learning, Apache Spark, Apache Flink, Apache Storm. These are all, you know, moving open source projects. And by being, you know, very much um, moving all the time, you have to be also sometimes carefully what these projects all are promising. So some can be unstable with their new functionality. It's a bit different from the stability if you look on AWS, but of course, these open source projects are free, so you can just use it without costs. There's a yeah, trade-off essentially in these things. That's my experience from practice really put into the game here. And for the sake of complementarity, um, there's also now the idea of not only thinking about how you combine them. Of course, Flink is is very is much more elements per seconds here if you compare them, uh, and with the growing a number of CPU cores, as then Storm. But also here you have to think about here you really need the memory that should be available to really exploit really the functionalities of Flink. If not, you're quickly then maybe down on the performance of Storm. Another idea maybe that puts you also to a different direction is then seeing these systems together. You can have actually Apache Kafka, which is a distributed streaming platform uh, used in business, uh, in quite amount of businesses worldwide. It's amazing and often used. So you can combine, of course, those platforms then that do more the gathering, the brokering, providing a platform for some analysis and then put different pieces in, for instance, here using now Apache Flink, if you have a system which has high amount of memory. And the Flink itself has lots of APIs where it can work in and also to really have event processing libraries to detect events and so on. Uh, it's really interesting. Also saying that a graph processing API and library is also alongside it. So you see several functionality very similar to Apache Spark, also in Apache Flink. Both are in memory systems. So it's getting really a wild jungle outside to really understand where are now the key you know, benefits of all of these different services. And as I said, it's a lively open source domain. Sometimes companies support that service, not the other one. And with this, you have really a tough uh, you know, analysis to do when you really want to do it in open source, which of the tools are really the best one for you. I think data streaming by far is the most complex one because velocity is such a key element in it. And to give you two different directions at the end of this lecture today, uh, just look us also in machine learning itself. We look now on the technology, on the streams of data. But what about if we have, let's say, different data as online learning coming all the time into your system and you want to learn from it. There you would have, of course, different types of online learning. So you can essentially chop these different parts into pieces and train online and machine learning live uh, algorithm and always continue to do so. So it's a, let's say, permanent loop that you would essentially create here. And at some point in time, you just evaluate and launch. But of course, on the fly in the back office, you could still learn from the data all the time. 
So that's what you can do with online learning. However, it's, it's from sometimes from the accuracy, of course, a bit questionable. Think about changing trends um, and, and things like that. Another approach which is often used in online machine learning is um, essentially not incrementally, but more batch learned. And this is almost a little bit similar like we heard from the mini batches, right? That is basically done with the distributed deep learning. But here it's more in a stream fashioned way. You train a machine learning algorithm, you evaluate the solution, launch it, and then update data time to time in the batch fashion. So not every single, let's say, different piece will be here used directly, but we wait for certain batches to pull through, which in a way seems to be much more stable machine learning system, but it really depends on your application system or question essentially what you want to deliver, what would be the very best of these both worlds. Just to say that of course machine learning also has to deal with these kind of online measurements. And now finally, the last slide where I think about um, streaming and science. We heard lots of business, lots of social media application example, but also of course in science and engineering, we have these um, challenges of data streams as well. The measurement devices get better and better. Seismic stations give out lots of different data. And in order to know that IFETA could is maybe, you know, breaking out again, we need these devices. Or as we had recently, essentially the earthquake, um, which was, a, you know, another event here, interestingly enough. So there's relevance for having the streaming data there. And the more quicker you can react to the streaming data, the more, you know, powerful you could maybe either help people that are in danger or let's say mitigate the, the kind of problems that they cause as natural events or natural hazards. But it's just one example of many. Please look at the video if you're interested. And this is really all I wanted to leave on the table here today for you. And essentially also is the whole course material. The next lecture we will see at the epilogue, we'll just discuss a little bit meta what we have learned in the course and what job opportunities there are. So see you then.